What is the significance of the New World Order? Significant enough to have it printed on the old dollar bill because here we can read in Latin Novus Ordo Seclorium, which means the New World Order. Why was it put there? If the New World Order is this important, what was the Old World Order? This New World International symbol for Freemasonry is identical to the one that was on the dollar bill with the same New World Order in Latin. What is the influence of secret societies and Freemasonry on our country and on the world? Some universal symbols of Freemasonry are the all-seeing eye seen here in the French Lodge and here on the old American dollar bill. The triangle, or the pyramid, with a separated capstone and is often with the all-seeing eye in it. The crown inside the cross. Why have so many of these symbols appeared on our dollar bill? Why do these symbols appear on churches? On hospitals. Or here on the cover of the original Jehovah's Witnesses watchtower. And here in the city of Pasadena and on Pasadena's city hall. Why does this all-seeing eye and the separated capstone or pyramid crown the throne of this Jewish high priest? Why is the Star of David printed on the back of this Knights Templar's book? And what would be the reason to put the Star of David on the presidential seal of the United States of America? Why is the Free Masonic Double X used as a logo for Exxon Corporation? Is this just another corporate logo? Or is it really a pyramid seen from above with the capstone missing? The unique double-headed eagle, another symbol of Freemasonry, is seen here outside the Scottish Rite Temple in Los Angeles, on the malls and dogma of Freemasonry, as well as on this Jewish menorah at City Hall. We know that many of our most famous presidents were free Masonic masters, and many were members of secret societies. Was that something of the past, or is it still happening? Today, some of the foremost dignitaries of the world, including presidents and former presidents of the United States, are still meeting, sometimes dressed in hoods, worshiping the owl. Is there a hidden agenda? Are there dominating powers in this world that we're not being informed about? These and many other important questions are discussed in our ancient mystery series. Starting with the matrix of power, a never-before-seen look into high power politics, secret societies, and how they influence our lives and our future. Ancient belief systems, a fascinating look at astrotheology, the influence of astrology and ancient belief systems on modern-day religion. Information contained in this tape is powerful, thought-provoking, and unique a must for anyone studying the roots of religion. Egypt, light of the world, an in-depth look at the ancient mysteries of Egypt and their influence on our history. Now this is how to order. For telephone orders, simply call the number on your screen. Call 1-800-795-TAPE. That's 1-800-795-8273. Matrix of Power, just $24.95 plus shipping and handling. 
Ancient belief systems, just $24.95, plus shipping and handle. Egypt, light of the world, just $24.95, plus shipping and handle. And now, as a special offer, you can order the entire three videotape ancient mystery series, including Matrix of Power, Ancient Belief Systems, and Egypt, Light of the World, a $74.85 value for only $59.95, plus shipping and handling within the United States. You can also get The Hidden Truth, a one-hour look at the ancient origins of modern religions. It's only $19.95, plus shipping and handling. And if you want to know more, you can also get The Naked Truth. Two riveting hours of historical facts exposing more details about the origin of modern religions. Historical facts that orthodox institutions would prefer you never knew. The Naked Truth is just $29.95, plus shipping and handling. For orders outside the continental United States, please email Lightworks for a quote on shipping and handling cost. Our email address is Lightworks at lightworksav.com that's lightworksav.com as in lightworks audio and video you may also mail or fax your order along with your credit card information to lightworks audio and video incorporated post office box 661593 los angeles california 90066 fax 310-397-4401 Solutions to the world's environmental crisis in the form of clean, non-polluting new energy technologies that may assure a future for mankind are coming to planet Earth in a groundbreaking new video. Free energy, the race to zero point. We live in a vast sea of energy. Everything, every atom, every subatomic particle is in constant motion, spinning eternally. Even in the cold, dark, absolute vacuum of empty space, there exists what new physics is calling the quantum vacuum flux. It is the ether of the ancients, the life force energy of metaphysics, are the random fluctuations of this vast field of potential in which space and time are embedded. Now, theoretically and mathematically proven, the question no longer is, does this zero-point energy exist? But rather, can we tap this inexhaustible resource of free and unlimited energy and manifest new technologies which are both inexpensive and environmentally safe? One thing is certain, if we continue on the course of rapidly burning fossil fuels and relying on nuclear fission, the future of our civilization is in grave jeopardy. We're at a critical juncture where the ravages of industrial pollution and radioactive waste have exceeded the carrying capacity of Mother Earth. Our finite reserves of oil and gas will be completely exhausted by the year 2025 at the present rate of consumption. Large corporate and governmental self-interest ignore this pending crisis and resist change to the status quo. The question must be asked, is this the kind of world we want to pass down to future generations? Emerging on the frontiers of science, a pioneering breed of theoretical physicists and inspired inventors are challenging the way we think about harnessing the unseen forces of nature. Despite ridicule, lack of funding, and outright suppression, they are confronting an outmoded classical worldview and ushering in a monumental scientific revolution. In this program, you will witness the groundbreaking work of tireless inventors and visionary scientists who may hold the keys to true energy independence for every person on Earth, from Nikola Tesla to the reality of coal fusion and beyond. Free energy, the race to zero point, $34.95, $39.95 in the PAL format, plus shipping and handling. Please add shipping and handling with all orders. For orders outside the continental United States, please email Lightworks for a quote on shipping and handling cost. Our email address is lightworks at lightworksav.com. That's lightworksav.com 
as in Lightworks Audio and Video. The program you're about to see is designed to stimulate a thoughtful exploration of what we know and the origins of what we believe we know about the most perplexing questions facing mankind. The opinions expressed in this program are those of the people in the program, and they are not the opinions, our views of the distributor. This program is offered in the interest of promoting an open discussion that may lead us to truth. As we've said before, we can all understand how the Ayatollah Khomeini or Saddam Hussein could be uh, a leader of some religion in a foreign country and we all are amazed at how many people, how many millions of people will follow such a man or follow such a religion and, uh, and we just attribute it to just mass hypnosis or mass lunacy. It's just incredible how those people follow their, their leaders in the Middle East or, or in China or somewhere else in the world. But we never apply that to ourselves. We have the same kind of blind obeisance given to creeds which are just not true, based on fantasies, based on lies, misperceptions, and yet we will fight to the death to defend our beliefs because, of course, the concept is that we have two parties here. We have the opposing team. They are always bad. And then there's our team, our boys, and they're always good. So anything we believe is the truth. Anything they believe is foolishness. When we talk about the Old Testament, a classic example of this is how much we really don't understand the God of the Bible. Testament, we have to keep in mind that there were three separate gods in the Old Testament. Now, happily, the um, Christians are not aware of that because Christians are not very well aware of the old or the ancient Semitic uh, system of things. In the Bible, Moses is referred to as as a warning against the uh, astrologers and those who read the future by the stars and Christians will point to that and say well see now there's astrology and so God said to have nothing to do with astrology reading the stars because that's evil well actually if you do your homework which most Christians have it but if you do your homework you're gonna find out that there were three separate gods in the Old Testament three distinct and different gods being worshipped in the Old Testament the first one was the stellar cult the stellar cult worshipped the stars and connected themselves with God through the study of the stars. The stellar cult, a Semitic cult, whose God was in the stars. Then there was the lunar cult, or the cult that worshipped God through the moon. And that's, of course, where the Hebrews come from. Their lineage is out of the lunar cult, or the Ptolemaic lunar cult of which Moses was said to be the leader. And that's why, of course, in Hebrew, uh, the days were always counted after sundown, because that's when the lunar god came out. 
the moon came up after sundown. And then, of course, there was Saturn, or the old Ugaritic god El. Saturn was infiltrated in the later days and becomes known as El, which is where we get Isis, Ra, El, I-S-R-A-E-L. Israel is Isis, Re, El, the Ugaritic god. Saturn. In order to understand the Old Testament and the New Testament, you have to first understand where the book comes from, who wrote it. You have to understand it in the context of the time in which it was written. I'm going to make a statement now that many people who are in denial will not want to hear, but if you give me an opportunity, I think I can prove the point. The Bible is nothing more, Old and New Testament, nothing more than a retelling of the most ancient story the world has ever known. And that's why the Bible's called the greatest story ever told. Not the greatest collection of facts, the greatest story ever told. And a cursory understanding of ancient history will show that the greatest story ever told was the story of the zodiac, astrology. The Bible is nothing more than the greatest astrological, astronomical story ever told. It is pure astrology based on the zodiac. No one's ever told you that before. No one would ever tell you such a thing. But the fact of the matter is, if you've done your homework, you're going to find that the Bible is nothing more than astrotheology, the worship of God's heaven. Christians today even believe that when they die, they're going to heaven with God's Son. Let me give you an example of how astrology permeates the Old Testament. Now, as I said, those who would not want to hear this are in denial. But as a teacher, I'm asking only to hear what I have to say. In the book of John, in the New Testament, John 14, 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. Well, like many other scriptures in the King James, that was not correctly translated. In fact, it is not in my Father's house are many mansions, because in fact that makes very little to no sense at all. How can you have houses or mansions in a house? In my Father's house are many mansions is correctly translated, in my Father's abode are many dwelling places, in my Father's heavens are many houses. Well, of course, there's at least 12 houses in the heavens that we know of. In my Father's abode, the heavens, there are many houses. That's right, at least 12 houses of the zodiac. That's what was being said here. Now we go to perhaps the oldest book in the Bible, Job. And in the book of Job, I ask you to turn to chapter 38 and read with me, if you can, where in 38, 31, 32, and 33, something very important is said concerning astrology. In chapter 38, 33, first, the scripture says, Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? In other words, there are ordinances in heaven. And 31 now, going back to 38, 31, God says to Job, according to the scripture, Can thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? What are we talking about here? The Pleiades, an astrological symbol in the zodiac. And God is supposedly saying to Job, can thou bind the sweet influences? What influences? I thought that that's all evil. That's all astrology. That's that new age stuff. We don't have anything to do with that. And here God is saying to his prophet Job, can thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Can thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Now there is a heavy piece of information. God is saying to Job 
in 32, 38, 32, can thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Or can thou guide Arcturus with his sons? We're talking astrology here. Now, if you go to the King James Version, that's the version that God spoke. And if we read from the King James Bible what the word Maseroth means. Here in the King James, in the interpreting, interpreting dictionary in the back of the King James, we look up the word Maseroth. And here we see Maseroth means the 12 signs of the zodiac. That's from the King James. Maseroth means the zodiac. And therefore God is saying to his great prophet Job, can thou bring forth the zodiac in his season? That's right, because the zodiac has 12 seasons, 12 houses. And that's why God's son, the light of the world, could say, in my father's abode are many houses. We're talking astrology here. But I'm going to tell you some of the most, one of the most interesting things you're going to find in the Bible about astrology is the end times. There is not a Christian program on anywhere that is not concerned with the end times, the last days, the end of the world. Jehovah's Witnesses are proclaiming all over the world that this is the end times. In fact, these are the last days. We are living in the end times. But the end times of what? If you understand that the Bible is nothing more than a retelling of astrology and the astrological zodiac, then you understand why it is that Jesus is referred to to have fed his people and his followers. God's son feeds his followers according to Matthew um, 14, 17. We read, and of course this is a very old story. We've all heard about how Jesus fed his followers with two fishes. And with two fishes and five loaves, he fed his people. The two fishes are, of course, the two fishes of the zodiac, which is the constellation of Pisces. Pisces is always symbolized as two fishes. Consequently, God's sun, that thing that comes up in the morning, feeds his people on earth in the sign of the two fishes. Now, if you think we're stretching this point, just continue to listen. Jesus is referred to as the great fisherman. And of course, that's why the Pope has the Pope's mitre, or the hat, or the headdress of the Pope, is the fish from Dagon, the fish god, because Rome ruled the world for 2,000 years under the age of Pisces. Here in a Bible dictionary glossary, we read that the age of Aquarius, the, astrologi the astrological era, which will begin in A.D. 2740, predicted to be the new age of peace. The past 2,000 years is the Christian era, having been the age of Pisces. So what we're talking about is that's why for 2,000 years almost we have been living in the age of our Lord. And our Lord was pictured in the scriptures as being the great fisherman who fed his people with two fish, Pisces. It's very simple. Now, when I said we want to talk about the end times, the last days, because all Christian religions are talking about the last days, it's time someone explains what it really means, what we're in the last days of. That, of course, is astrology. I want to read to you from Matthew 28:20 20 to begin this discussion. Here we read in Matthew 28:20 20 where Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things whatever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. We've been hearing about the end of the world for 2,000 years. What does this mean? It is a mistranslation. That is not the word that was originally in the original text. End of the world is a mistranslation. The correct translation is the end of an age. 
And I want to read to you from the Bible to explain to you that what was being said here in the, again, at Matthew 28, 20, we want to read again. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's the correct translation, yeah. not end of the world. When we see that the King James Bible in their interpreting dictionary gives us the interpretation of the word Maseroth from the King James Bible, the word Maseroth means the 12 signs of the zodiac. I didn't write it, I'm just reading it. The scriptures are nothing more than astrological or what is called in theology, astrotheology. The Bible is nothing more than a retelling of the astrotheology of the ancient world. It is purely astrology. But it has been cleverly covered so that Christians will not know that. But anyone who even tries to, for a few moments, just to relate the things which are taught about God's Son, the light of the world, who has 12 helpers, it all becomes very clear if you can get past the original denial and understand that that's what the Bible is. Pure astrology, astrotheology. Now, as we brought out before about the can now bring forth Maseroth in his season being the, the signs of the zodiac, we want to talk about how Jesus, of course, was the great fisherman and he fed his people, his followers, with two fishes. The two fishes, of course, the two fishes of the zodiac, Pisces. That's why, incidentally, if you think about it, that's why all of the kings in the Eastern Europe and Western Europe and pretty much throughout the rest of the world accepted the new calendar dating time from the birth of our Lord. Why would pagan kings, potentates, of different countries, different races, different religions, why would they all accept the birth of our Lord as being the beginning of the new calendar? And why would we be in the year 1991? Quite simply, it's because it was the beginning of the age of Pisces. And Pisces is the fisherman, the shoes of the fisherman, the, the ring of the fisherman that the Pope wears. The Pope's mitre is nothing more than a fish's head. As a matter of fact, Joshua, or Yahashua, Joshua, was called Joshua the son of Nun, because in Hebrew the word Nun meant fish. Jesus, the great fisherman, Jehoshua, or Joshua, the son of Nun, the son of the fish. All we're saying is that this is nothing more than the sun, the orb of day, ruling the world for 2,000 years in the age of our Lord, the fish, Pisces. Now, when the end of the age of Pisces is coming, and we will be going into the new age of Aquarius, oh, but that's devil worship, that's evil, that's astrology. No, that's the Bible. What house of the zodiac does God's son go into when he leaves the age of Pisces? Because he's been in the age of Pisces now for 1991 years, he's getting ready since each age is about 2,000, a little over 2,000 years long. What house will God's son go into once he has, once he has served the last Passover? which is the last year, the last Passover in the age of Pisces, the last year in the age of Pisces. Where does God's Son go for the next 2,000 years? Well, of course, we understand he goes into the age of Aquarius. Well, the age of Aquarius, that evil astrology, the age of Aquarius is symbolized if you can get any reference book, you will find the age of Aquarius is symbolized by the man with the water pitcher. The man with the water pitcher or the water barrier, the water bearer. The age of Aquarius, the man with the water pitcher. Christians know that that is a terrible and evil sign 
that has to do with the new age. But where did that story of the new age in Aquarius come from? It comes from the Bible. God's Son, at Luke 22.10, when God's Son is asked by his 12 apostles as to where he will go to the next, after this 2,000 years of the great fisherman, or the fishes is over, where will he begin his new kingdom? He says at 22.10 of Luke, and he said unto them, Behold, when you enter into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. We're talking astrology here. Behold, when you enter into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. That's right. The man bearing a pitcher of water is Aquarius. It's very simple. Now, how do we know that the Bible's talking about the new Aquarian age or the old age of Pisces? All you have to do is your homework. I'm going to read some scriptures and I want you to follow what I'm saying because I think it's very important. Starting with 28.20 of Matthew. Matthew 28.20, as we said before, we read before that Matthew 28.20 said that the end of the world, we're talking about the end of the world, and surely I am with you, the King James says, to the very end of the world. Well, no, actually, as we said, it's the end of the age. So I'm going to read to you some scriptures from the Bible, and I want you to jot down these scriptures. They're very important. Let's start with Matthew 28.20, and he says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In Matthew 12, uh, 32, the Holy Spirit will not be given either in this age or the age to come. In Matthew 13, 39, the harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels, and the weeds are pulled up and burned in fire, so it will be at the end of the age. End of the age. That's what we're talking about, the end of the age, the Piscean age, the last days. Here in Matthew 24, 3, and what will be the sign of your coming? The apostles asked God, Sam, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? In Mark 10, we read in Mark 10, 29 and 30, and in the age to come, eternal life. So we're talking about the age to come. And here in Luke 19, no, Luke 18, 30, the kingdom of God will fail and receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. So we're talking about in this age, in the age to come. So we're talking about two different ages. Here in 1 Corinthians, we read again, 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 8. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age. And in 8, none of the rulers of this age understood it. Here in 1 Corinthians again, 10, 11, these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us upon whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. We're talking ages. In Ephesians 1, 21, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Hebrews 6, 5, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the coming age. This is Bible. This is not New Age devil worship. This is the scriptures. In Hebrew again, Hebrews 9, 26, then Christ would have come, would had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he has appeared once for all at the end of the age. 
And in Revelation 15, 3, God Almighty is King of the ages. What we're talking about here is ages. The old age of Pisces, God's son ruling for 1991 years under the age of Pisces. And what we're looking forward to in the Bible is God's kingdom to come. His will to be done on earth. And that kingdom is the kingdom which is said, Behold, when you enter into the city, there shall be a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. We're talking about getting ready to go into the new age of Aquarius. The man with the water pitcher. So when you hear Christians talking about the last days and the end of the world and the end times, we're talking about the end of the age of Pisces. We're talking about, yes, the end times, the end of the age of Pisces and the coming age of the man with the water pitcher. It's purely astrology, has no basis whatsoever in actual historical fact. There is no facts in the New Testament. It is totally the greatest story ever told. To further clarify some of the symbolism used in the Bible, showing that it is nothing more than an astrological story or astro astronomical story, uh, the ram's horn, which is used by the Jews to usher in the new year. The ram's horn is, of course, from Aries, the ram, in the constellation of Aries. As we said, Pisces is the two fishes, and uh, Taurus, the bull, where uh, in India, that was the ancient Hindu period of time, was Taurus the bull, and that's why bulls and cows are sacred in India. Of course, Leo the lion in the constellation, when the sun is in the constellation of Leo. And, of course, Iosis, or Jesus, is referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah because of Leo. And then, of course, we have the virgin, Virgo the virgin, of which all... 16 of the crucified saviors of the ancient world were always born of a virgin because of Virgo and as we said Aquarius being the water bearer. In Christianity the concept of the Trinity is said to be very difficult to explain if not impossible so therefore one must accept it on belief. You have a uh, an obligation to just believe that God is a triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And it can't be explained, obviously, because it's a very spiritual mystery. Actually, it's not a mystery. It's a mystery if you're trying to cover up something. It's very simple to understand if you know where it came from. As uh, one of my teachers used to say, you better do your homework. The story of the Trinity goes back to Egypt, where the God the Father was never seen, but God the Son, as we have said before in the program, was named Horus, and he comes up on the horizon, Horus is rising, and of course he dies at sunset, and that was the name of the ancient God of darkness, Set, and at midday, of course, at the peak of the pyramid, midday, 12 o'clock, he was God the Most High, because at that point the Son is the Most High. That was the original trinity. God's Son, who is risen in the morning. God's Son, uh, the Holy Spirit, who dies at night and goes away, uh, only to come back another day to be resurrected. And, of course, as we said, at 12 noon, he becomes the Most High. That was the original trinity. It's just that simple, that the uh, original human creatures on the earth understood that there were three points in creation. The beginning, when you're born, maturity at the mature age, and then death from old age. And so that was the original trinity. It's really not very difficult to understand at all. Unless, of course, you're trying to build a story around something that just isn't true. And then it becomes difficult to explain. Now, if we want to, we want to talk about Horus, God's son, the light of the world, he was always pictured as a sun, and the sun was an eye, of course the eye, the realm, part of the eye, that's why the ancients understood God's son to be the eye of the universe. As far back even before Egypt, we find that the context of the story goes very, very far back in the history. We're talking about 
maybe five, six thousand years ago. Here's a book interesting, An Old Enemy, Satan and the Combat Myth. And here we see the Prince of Darkness doing battle with God's Son. As a matter of fact, when we say that this whole concept of Christianity and the Trinity and God's Son uh, at, at war with the Prince of Darkness, that is a very old motif. But to show you how old it really is, we have here Moore's Hindu Pantheon. Moore's Hindu Pantheon. A fine book on the Hindu religion. Now we're talking about 5,500 to 6,000 years ago. Roughly 4,000 years before Christ. And in here we see that there is a tri the triune God, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Same thing. Same story in Christianity. And of course, naturally, when one looks through the Hindu pantheon, we find that there are thousands of gods. And I'm not going to bore you with all the pictures here of showing you the gods of India, but the second person in the Indian Hindu trinity, Brahma being the father, Vishnu being the son, and Shiva being the Holy Spirit, Vishnu, God's son, the second person in the Hindu trinity, is pictured here in the book Hindu pantheon as a man hanging on nothing with the sun under him being God's son who dies on the cross. This is Hinduism 4,000 years before Christ. It's a very old story. You've got to do your homework to understand how far back it really goes. I want to draw your attention to Malachi 4, where in Malachi, Old Testament, Malachi 4.2, we read, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son, S-U-N, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And of course we remember that God's son referred to um, Jerusalem as saying that he wished to draw Jerusalem under his wing like a mother hen does her chick. And here we see God's son arises with healing in his wings. Or where do we get that from? Again, we go back to ancient Egypt. God's son, Horus, with healing in his wings. Uh, also we have here in Jeremiah 18 another classic example of how the Old Testament is nothing more than a retelling of the old ancient stories Jeremiah 18 reading from 1 through 6 the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause thee to hear my words then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay were marred in the hands of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, are, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. So here we have God pictured as the great potter who can mold man. That's the Old Testament, Jeremiah 18. Where did that come from? Again, from Egypt. For God was referred to as the great potter that molds man on the potter's wheel. It's not Jewish. It's not Old Testament, it's Egyptian. Then, of course, the, as we brought out before, circumcision being a very holy and sacred rite to Moses and the early Hebrews. We find that circumcision was actually a very ancient Stone Age practice in Egypt many thousands of years ago. Circumcision of the males was for the allowing sexual practices in the religion. It had nothing to do with being holy. It had to do with sex worship. That's why the foreskins were cut to make arousal quicker and easier in their sexual religion.
nothing holy about circumcision. One might ask themselves, why is it that Roman Catholic Pope and Cardinals wear the Jewish yarmulke? That's because the Old Testament, one of the Old Testament gods was El, Yahweh. And El can be traced back to the planet Saturn. And that's why when you are married, before the god El, you would wear the ring. The ring is the ring of the planet Saturn. And when kings are crowned in the ancient Middle East, Semitic kings especially, they would always wear round crowns because of the round circle around Saturn. And that, of course, is why we have yarmulkes wearing the round yarmulke. If you will recall, the, um, in the Middle Ages, many of the Catholic priests and, uh, would shave their heads in round circles. So that's where the yarmulke comes from, from the worship of El or Saturn. The Star of David, of course, is the Star of Saturn. We uh, can trace the Star of David or the Shield of Solomon, as it has been called, back to the ancient worship of El in Israel, El being the planet Saturn in the ancient world. And here on the presidential seal, you will see the Star of David on the American presidential seal. Here you see the 13 stars making up the Star of David or the Shield of Solomon on the presidential seal. 13 because in honor of God's Son with his 12 symbols of the zodiac or the 12 helpers, 12 plus, the, plus God's Son makes 13. That's why 13 is an unlucky number. We have 13 stars in the symbol of the Star of David. As a matter of fact, you will find that there are 13 arrows, there are 13 leaves. If you look real close, there are 13 berries in the 13 leaves. There are 13 stripes, there are 13 cloudbursts, there are 13 feathers in each wing. There are 13 layers on the other side of the bill in the pyramid. There are 13 letters in Anat Coeptus. 13 is a very important number in astrotheology. The 13, as I said, is because of God's Son in the 12. It has to do with very esoteric ancient religious philosophies. It has little to nothing to do with truth. Saturn, of course, in Greek was Kronos or Chaos. Saturday or Saturn was always associated with trouble and chaos, destruction, before a coming of a new era of time or a new age and that's why incidentally even the seven days of the week our last day is Saturday in honor of Saturn who ends the period of time Saturn Saturday and the beginning of the week of, of course for us now in this period of time is Sunday God's Son the light of the world here in Deuteronomy 6 8 God commands his followers in Deuteronomy 6, 8, saying, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Orthodox Judaism has a custom of having a small box in the middle of the forehead. That, of course, goes back to ancient Chinese dynasties, where the priest in China would put the small box between their eyes, in which the law was written in Chinese, not Hebrew. That, of course, is bar borrowed from a very ancient society. And also, we want to talk about the fact that the Egyptians had a leader filling the place of Moses by the name of Hermes, and his writings were held in a similar estimation, as they were believed to be inspired and dedicated by infinite wisdom. So we see the connection between Hermes and Moses. And second, the Egyptians had a priesthood of wealth and power and possessed the same sacerdotal caste system as those of the Jews. And third, the priesthood was hereditary and confined to certain tribes, as it was also with the Jews. And according to Diodorus of Sicily and also 
nearly all of their ceremonies were essentially the same. So we find out that so much of what we call Judaism was exactly the same in the ancient Egyptian. Interesting too that Egypt before Israel had a scapegoat because there were two goats always sacrificed. One would be killed and one would be allowed to leave the town taking the sins of the town with him. So the one that left, the animal that left, would be said to have escaped. And that's where we get the term scapegoat. Um, then we find that uh, both the ancient Egyptians and the Hebrews practiced circumcision. And as we have the authority of Herodias saying that the Jews and Phoenicians borrowed the custom from the most ancient Egyptians. Both Jews and Egyptians took their shoes off when approaching the holy place which was what the Egyptians call the temple. Interesting that in Egypt they had the temples thousands of years before Hebrews had temples. The word temple, meaning house of God or house of El, comes from the ancient worship of El, the old Semitic ancient god, such as the temple at Luxor, the temple at Thebes, the temple at Karnak, 